Welcome in to OutKick the Show. I'm your fearless leader, Clay Travis. I hope you guys have all had a fantastic Monday so far. I hope that your weeks are off and running in a spectacular fashion. I want to remind you, go to Oddshark for all of your gambling and informational related needs. Great show this morning. Fantastic weekend in Vegas. My thanks to Oddshark for hosting us out there. My thanks to the crew at Caesars for letting me meet Britney Spears. Highlight of my early 20s life for sure. Awesome time in Vegas. The MS ESPN shirts will be ready very soon. I appreciate all of you. we got a big show to get to today and there are lots of issues and many of them are serious. at six game suspension. Going to talk about more NFL anthem protests and why did I turn down two different television shows on FS1 and what does that mean about my future if anything. But we begin with a clear and definitive statement. I hate racism more than anyone else on social media. I hate cancer more than anyone else on social media. I hate death more than anybody else on social media. So let's get all the banal cliches out of the way before we actually roll into the mess that was Charlottesville over the weekend. Now I've done my research. I was drunk for much of the weekend in Vegas so I wasn't aggressively paying attention to this but I want to kind of dive into this story and learn from it. What do we know? First of all, the left and the right wing in this country are slowly strangling those of us in the middle, like myself, who I call a radical moderate. They're turning us against everybody and that's because the left wing and the right wing in this country are getting far too much attention and all of the reasonable people out there are sitting back saying, wait a minute, I don't like Nazis and I also don't like cops getting shot by Black Lives Matter activists or sympathizers, right? And so the vast majority of people lie somewhere in between, right? You don't like right-wing Nazis and you don't like left-wing Black Lives Matter activists who are going out and killing cops because they believe that they're racist. Like 90% of us are somewhere in the middle there, right? 5% is probably too high, the fringe groups on both sides, but let's say that they're 5% on each side, all right? Let's say that they are overwhelming huge tiny percentages of the population but they're overwhelmingly covered in the media. Are we doing things to make the far left and the far right more successful or are we doing things to make the far left and the far right less successful? I think right now the way the media and social media cover situations such as these we are making it worse. Let me explain why. This whole incident arose because there is a group out there that believes that by removing memorials to Confederate officers they are going to make the world a better place. You guys know that I am a history junkie. I love all of American history. I have spent most of my life studying it. I do not believe that removing history is the way to combat historical issues that make you uncomfortable. Okay? That's my belief. People can disagree. But when you start to remove historical statues and relics you are attacking in many ways people's sense of self. All right? And so they believe that they are under assault and that their history and that their heritage is also under assault. Now that provokes situations such as this one. If the Robert E. Lee statue at the University of Virginia had never been contemplated for removal then this entire situation this dangerous sort of toxic cocktail of angry people would never have emerged. All right? So I am of the belief that just like it would be crazy to do what ISIS does and go around tearing down things that you don't believe reflect your version of what the world should be like that is what is going on in the mind of many people on the right wing side. Now that's not talking about the Nazis. The Nazis then use this controversy as a reason to gin up their support with the idea 
that the white race is under assault and that they have to stand up for the white race. Here is a basic question. Like, I, I wish more people would understand this, but they don't. The United States history is fundamentally more racist than the history of the Confederate States of America. When the Civil War started in 1861, both sides allowed slavery. What happened was the South lost, and so whatever views the South had from 1861 to 1865 are preserved forever in amber. That is, they've never evolved or changed. If you go back and study early KKK history, they didn't use the Confederate flag to represent them. They used the United States flag because it allowed slavery far longer. Most people who fought in the Civil War on the Union or the Confederate side were racist. Okay, I'm giving you a historical background here. Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves in 1863 on January 1st as a method to try and prevent other foreign powers, i.e. England and France, from entering on behalf of the United States, of the Confederate States. It was a brilliant strategic ploy. But it didn't even free the slaves in border states that remained loyal to the Union. It only freed slaves in the states that had seceded from the United States. Secession was legal under the Constitution. This is not an example of somebody behaving in a totally irrational fashion. Prior to the Civil War, the idea in the country was that each of the individual states had the right to withdraw from the Union. That was what the Supreme Court would have said. It's why Abraham Lincoln never allowed this to be challenged by the Supreme Court. It's why Jefferson Davis, who became the President of the Confederacy, held out hope that he was going to be arrested for treason before he left as a Senator from Washington so that it could be proven that the southern states had the right to secede and then when they were invaded by the north they were able to defend themselves. Okay, That's the historical reality. People don't understand that because they want history to be broken down into good versus evil, this Disneyfication of our past. That's not accurate. Okay, The Confederate soldiers by and large did not own slaves, the vast majority of them. And the Confederate generals were totally reasonable, middle-of-the-road people politically, by and large. They were not right-wing or left-wing zealots, okay? The truth of the matter is this. Which side you fought for in the Civil War was a function of geography. You were not making a decision about whether or not you believed slavery was right or wrong. By and large, 95% or more, 98 99% of soldiers fought for whichever state they happened to live in. If you lived in Virginia, you fought for Virginia. That's why Robert E. Lee turned down the commanding offer for all of the United States armies. People forget that Robert E. Lee was brought in and Abraham Lincoln offered him command of the entire United States armies. At the time, Robert E. Lee was living so close to Washington, D.C. that he could look over and see the Capitol. If you've ever toured Arlington, where Robert E. Lee lived, he was right on top of the Potomac River, literally just across the river. He ide idealized George Washington. If you read books about Robert E. Lee, he believed himself to be doing the same thing that George Washington had done back in 1776 when he led the revolution for his whole country at the time against Great Britain. So the idea that Robert E. Lee was a crazy racist ideologue is absurd. And so when you look at the historical record here, what I want you guys to think about is the Confederate beliefs that existed from 1861 to 1865 are frozen in amber. The fact that the United States was every bit as racist as the Confederate States pretty much for much of its history is lost, right? Because the United States has the ability to evolve. And so the flag, which is a symbol, comes to represent evolution. The fact that the KKK used the United States flag for so long changes when you consider in the context of the Civil Rights Movement when you consider it in the context of the desegregation of the armed forces, if the Confederacy had won the Civil War, it's a lunacy to believe that it would have had slavery up till today. At some point in time, slavery would have ended like it has pretty much everywhere in the country and the world. It would have ended, right? And later, maybe it would have been 1890 when the Confederacy ended slavery instead of 1863. Maybe it would have been 1874. I don't know what year it would have been, but at some point it would have ended in the Confederacy too. And so... It's lazy for people to use the Confederacy from 1861 to 1865 and use it as an excuse 
to represent a modern day thought process. Now, the allowing people from the far right, right to far right too, to hijack the Confederate flag, if you're a history buff like I am, is one of the great flaws of the nation, right? It's also one of the great flaws of the way that social media works today, that when a crazy guy walked into a Charleston, uh, Charleston area uh, 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 church and shot nine people because he was racist, that immediately people said, oh, we got to ban the Confederate flag. That racist guy had his picture taken with it, and so that means that the Confederate flag is always racist. Well, every Muslim terrorist has his picture taken with the Quran, and I don't hear people saying, oh, we have to ban the Quran after every time some misguided Muslim terrorist uses his bastardized version of religion as a symbol through the Quran to attack people. I don't hear people say, oh, we've got to remember the vast majority of people are not like this individual. Instead, almost immediately in our hyper-sensitive, hyper-politicized uh, hyper universe, when somebody represents a group, they represent all that group. We saw it happen when the shooting happened with Black Lives Matter down in Dallas. When that guy who was missing made the decision, I'm going to go kill cops, same thing in Baton Rouge, because cops are trying to kill black people, the media had so sold that guy an artificial version of reality that his brain got all twisted up, just like this idiot 20-year-old who drove into the protest. Okay, so I say all of that. We are creating a combustible universe by which we put these two groups, the Black Lives Matter far left and the far right idiots, I think they're both idiots, right? And they are then creating a powder keg. I thought that in Charlottesville, the police did a bad job of trying to protect what was going on here. There should have never been a situation where this kind of danger existed. But I do believe that Charlottesville is evidence, and somebody just said in the comments, that the media is tearing America apart. And this is an ugly situation. This is one that is seemingly happening more and more where conflict is being created to sensationalize divisions in this country and extremism is being rewarded and the vast majority of you right now watching this show, listening to this show who are in the middle part of the country saying, my God, this is crazy. We are left on the sidelines and the two extremes of our country are yelling at each other. And it's, it's a broken system. And I have a radical idea and people say, oh, Clay Travis is racist. I have a radical idea. Clay Travis is racist for saying this. I have a radical idea. I think that every race has racists. And I think the way the country and the media covers racism, it only matters if white men pretty much are racist. Nobody else gets accused of racism. So if you're a white guy and you believe anything other than racism is awful, then you get labeled as a racist. Come out and say anything. Black guy, Hispanic guy, Asian guy, you guys can say anything. But it's a broken system that exists right now and the extremes are driving all the reaction and those of us in the middle are getting left behind. That is the truth of the matter. And so when I see all these powder keg moments and I use the powder keg like the removal of a Confederate statue, another powder keg might be a transgender bathroom law. I take a step back and I say, okay, let's, let's kind of think about this from a basic reasonable perspective. What is gained by taking down a statue that has been up for over a hundred years? What benefit is being conveyed to society by the removal of that statue? Is the world a better place with that statue gone? I don't understand it. So when I look at it from a basic cause and effect perspective, my position is if you are going to change something, then there needs to be a massive benefit to society, right? Because you are antagonizing a huge group of people, all right? And that is, to me, one of the big challenges here, we gain absolutely nothing from the removal. And that's the truth. So, uh, questions about Charlottesville. I agree. The ISIS taking down monuments is a bad look. Should we take down the pyramids because slaves built them? I mean, honest question. Slaves built the pyramids. They're one of the wonders in the world. Should we blow up the pyramids in Egypt because slaves created them? Um, I think it is a really difficult situation. And again, Use your brains. This is, uh, again, a total mess. All right, what questions do you guys have about Charlottesville? What questions do you guys have about Charlottesville? As a history buff, I think the biggest flaw is the idea that the Confederate beliefs, like people are like, oh, 
the Southern Confederacy were like the Nazis. No. No, they were not like the Nazis. They had the constitutional right to secede. They fought a war over whether or not they could be subjugated, right? And they only existed for four years. And when the war started, if you read history at all, the difference between the North and the South was very, very small, right? And this idea, once the North and the South came together, everything that has happened since then, the United States gets the benefit of the doubt, but the Confederate beliefs are frozen in amber. So that is the truth. Um, questions? Questions out there. Did Trump handle it right? I, one of the things that I don't like about modern politics is it's being driven by social media. It's being driven by social media and social media demands that you have action. Like even when I was on at, the, at Vegas uh, going to my Britney Spears concert hanging out in Vegas for a day everything was constantly like my phone was blowing up and people saying how come you're not commenting on Charlottesville? How come you're not discussing the situation in Charlottesville? And the answer was because I wasn't on social media. I was just drinking and having a good time in Vegas. And also because what do you want me to get on social media and say? That I think racism is bad? Do you think there are a lot of people out there following me who are like, I didn't know what I thought about racism, but then Clay Travis got on Twitter and he said racism is bad. And I was like, you know what? Clay Travis has completely changed my opinion. Clay Travis changed my opinion. Before Clay Travis said racism is bad, I had absolutely no idea that racism was bad. And by the way, it's so when I say that, like how did Trump respond, he's created this dynamic where he reacts so often on Twitter that people expect for him to go on social media and be like, it's bad. I feel bad that, that someone died. I feel bad that racism exists. I feel bad that the situation in Charlottesville turned so violent. I feel bad about all these things. Like, does anyone really believe that the president who has grandchildren who are Jewish is a fundamental racist? Like, I just... I don't, I'm, I, maybe I'm crazy in this, but I don't believe the worst about people. And so if I'm going to brand somebody as something bad, then there has to be really strong evidence that it exists. There has to be really strong evidence that something like that exists for me in order to do it. So that is the truth. Um, that is the truth. Why don't you read comments? Because a lot of your comments are not very good. And because the commenters in here represent a tiny pinprick of the overall people who will consume this content. So uh, that, is the, uh, that is the truth. So I just think it's ugly. I think it doesn't actually help anything. I think the removal of historical documents and relics and statues because somehow they are connected to things that people don't like hundreds of years ago. Everyone, let's be honest, everyone in the 1800s, by and large, just about, was racist. Okay? Thomas Jefferson was racist. He also founded a great university, he also went out and created basically the Declaration of Independence. He purchased the Louisiana Purchase from France. But he wasn't perfect. He was racist. And so what are you going to do? You're going to tear down the Washington Monument? You're going to tear down the, uh, the, Thomas, the, the Jefferson Memorial in D.C.? What are you going to do with the fact? Are you going to rename Washington, D.C.? People are products of their times. If you study history, one of the things that you learn more than anything else is that people reflect their times. And right now in 2017, there are probably things that our great-grandchildren see us doing that they're going to consider to be heinous. What those are, we don't know because everybody is a product of their times. If I had to predict now, I would say a few hundred years from now, people may not eat meat. And so everybody who ate meat right now, they'll be like, oh my God, do you remember that guy Clay Travis? He's my grandpa. You know, Grandpa used to eat meat. Can you believe that he just ate animals? Can you believe that people used to go and hunt animals? Animals are living things, and then they would cut them up, and they would eat them. Can you believe that? Grandpa, great-grandpa is so old, he's a meat eater. For Thanksgiving, he wants a turkey. Grandpa, you can't eat animals. You can't do that anymore. People assume that nothing changes. There are things that we do today that our great-grandchildren will call us awful human beings for doing. My bet would be meat eating. My bet will be that like people will look at pictures of somebody carving a turkey several hundred years from now and they'll be like, oh my God, can you believe how awful those humans were? They used to kill turkeys and then cut them up. Great grandpa ate steak. He used to kill cows. He used to shoot Bambi and then eat him. Like we have this idea that things don't change and in reality they do. 
And so freezing historical relics in amber and judging people historically for the opinions they had in 1865 in 2017 is the fount of stupidity and anyone who studies history should know that. But in our society today, nobody studies history and everything is either pure evil or pure good, even though, as we all know, humans are neither of both. Um, okay, Zeke Elliott. The Zeke Elliott situation to me is an example of the NFL just making awful decisions. The NFL should have never suspended Zeke Elliott. If you're not charged with a crime, you shouldn't be suspended from playing a football game. I've been on this uh, soapbox for years. It doesn't make sense. The NFL is making a bad decision when they connect their brand to the suspension of a player without criminal charges being filed. Roger Goodell is on record as saying mere guilt or innocence isn't enough. Actually, it is. It's the very foundation of our jurisdictional system. There's no way on earth that a player should be suspended and have his paycheck taken away for something that is not a legal offense. Now, I didn't come after Roger Goodell for his investigation of Tom Brady because I said at least that's somewhat relating to on-the-field related activity. I've been involved in the criminal justice system as a lawyer before. It's very hard to get things right in the criminal justice system. The NFL should know that it should never, ever be in the business of conducting an investigation. When Adrian Peterson gets charged with child abuse, the first thought that people should, should have should not be, hey, what's the NFL going to do about Adrian Peterson beating up his kid? When Ray Rice knocks out his fiance on the elevator in New Jersey, the first thought should be not, how many games is he going to be played? The criminal justice system should be involved in all criminal justice investigations. There is no way on earth that the NFLPA, that's the NFL Players Association, should have ever agreed to this power from Roger Goodell. And there's no way that it should still exist. I would challenge a case like this if I was Ezekiel Elliott on principle alone. I doubt that he will do it, but he should. Speaking of the NFL, right now it's time to go on and go ahead and buy your tickets to the NFL or college football. I'm going to be in Atlanta for Tennessee, Georgia Tech, and Bama, Florida State. And if you're going to be there as well, you better get on SeatGeek and go check out the prices. You can set price alerts. Maybe you're willing to pay a certain amount to get in. If you go download the SeatGeek app, app, go to the settings tab, click add a promo code, put in the promo code OUTKICK and you'll get $20 off with your first purchase. Again, Georgia Tech against Tennessee and Florida State against Bama. Those are the first two games that I will be at this fall. We got really cool news coming about some of the stuff that we're going to be doing with OutKick this fall. I can't wait. OutKick VIP is coming soon. But you need to go ahead and start saving money. Download the SeatGeek app. Go into the settings tab. Click add a promo code. And on that promo code, put in the promo code OutKick and you will save $20 on your first purchase. And you will be glad that you did it. I get this stuff a lot. Clay is alt-right. I don't even know what that means. Are there lots of alt-right people who are pro-choice, who are anti the death penalty? I am not alt-anything. I am a radical moderate. I look at facts over feelings and I make decisions about what makes sense from there. I don't think there are very many alt-right people who voted for Barack Obama twice. I don't think there are very many alt-right people who worked on Al Gore's presidential campaign. I don't think that there are very many alt-right people again, who are pro-choice and anti-the-death penalty. But I don't get into labels like that very much. It's a lazy criticism. It's a lazy criticism. If you try to label someone to discount what they are saying, you've lost the argument. If you're out there saying, oh, so-and-so's racist, homophobic, sexist, or whatever else, as opposed to combating what the legitimate things that they're actually saying represent, you're doing what Google did when the Google engineer put out his perspective. You are not forwarding the First Amendment. I say that I only believe in two things, 100% absolute, without any fail. The First Amendment and boobs. I believe in the First Amendment and boobs 100%. Neither one has ever led me astray. Those are the only two things that I believe in 100%. And I believe that unfortunately in this country the ability of First Amendment debate is being severely circumscribed by the degree to which legitimate debate is being called into question. There are so many people out there today who don't involve themselves in the political process because they are afraid of saying something that others brand racist, sexist, homophobic, transphobic, and losing their jobs. As a result, there is a lot of anger out there, and the anger is what is motivating many of Donald Trump's voters because they feel like they're not being listened to, and as a result, they are not being heard 
And so they lead to results such as this one. And that's what got Donald Trump elected, honestly. A upset group that believed they were not being heard. Uh, speaking of not being heard, more anthem protests. More anthem protests um, are out there. We had uh, Michael, what's his name, Michael Bennett took a knee or sat down or whatever the hell he did. And Marshawn Lynch said he's not been standing up for the national anthem for 11 years. My position on this is straightforward, all right? My position on this is straightforward. This is really bad business for the NFL, all right? I've said this. If you listen to the radio show this morning, what I equated it with was, I want you to follow me along on two analogies. If you are going to work and you walk outside into your front yard and you have a Trump or a Hillary or who I voted for, Gary Johnson, the Libertarian candidate, you have their sign up in your front yard. That's your right. That's your property. If you pull that sign out of the yard and then you put it in your back seat and you drive to work, you get to work and there's a front yard at your office and you put the Trump, Hillary, or Gary Johnson sign in the front yard, that's not permissible, right? That is the truth. People understand the difference between your private property. Another example. If you want to put on your private car a bumper sticker with a political opinion, pro-life, pro-choice, whatever you are, Hillary, Trump, Gary Johnson, whatever you are, on your bumper sticker. That's perfectly acceptable. If you get to work and you pull up and you're a UPS or you're a FedEx driver and you move over to your, uh, to your vehicle and you put that bumper sticker on the vehicle, that is not in any way, in my opinion, justifiable. And I think FedEx and UPS would agree with me. My point on this is straightforward. Once you are wearing a uniform and engaged in your job, there is almost no one in America who can wear a uniform and take a political stance on any subject. All right? If you wear a uniform, if somebody at Walmart was wearing a Make America Great hat as they checked out customers, it would go viral and Walmart would immediately disavow it. The same thing would happen if somebody had on a I'm with her hat or an I'm with her shirt trying to define Hillary Clinton. Whatever these NFL players' political views may be, my opinion is share them when you're not dressed in your uniform representing your team about to go out onto the field. Now, I also have believed this, and I've been saying it for a while, I don't really understand why we need national anthems at professional sporting events either. Okay, I don't think it makes a lot of sense. I don't think it makes any sense at all to decide that you are going to protest something when you're at your job. I think that's the truth. And so when you really break it down, why do we have the national anthem and flyovers at sporting events? College makes a little bit more sense, right? College makes a little bit more sense. It makes It's more rational. It makes total sense, all right? Because those are at least state universities. We don't play the national anthem before movies. I just went to go see the Emoji movie, all right? I just went to see the Emoji movie. How weird would you think it was if you were with me and your kids and you had to stand up for the national anthem before the Emoji movie? I understand that they do it at the, at, on bases. A lot of you are soldiers and you'd let me know that on, on military bases they do it. But most of the rest of us would think it's weird. I think playing the national anthem before a professional sports team takes the field is a strange occurrence. Having said that, it's become a tradition. And part of your job when you are on the field conducting your job wearing your uniform is to follow normal behavioral guidance, right? I think the NBA actually mandates that guys stand for the national anthem. And it's certainly commonplace for guys to stand for the national anthem in the NFL as well. And so if you're making the decision to protest and make a political statement during the time when you're supposed to play, during, by the way, the only three hours that really you work in terms of everybody watching you all week long, why can't you go on your social media and make whatever complaints or claims you want? Why can't you in your free time donate money and time to whatever political spout, whatever political cause you espouse? I just think it's bad business for the NFL to have guys doing this when it hurts franchise interest and it hurts overall the NFL brand. That's my opinion. So I'm not going to spend much time worrying about these guys because I think they're doing it to try to make money. I don't think they're doing it in a genuine way. And also, they sound like idiots when they talk about what they're protesting. Michael Bennett said he's not standing up for the national anthem because he's protesting oppression. Nobody in the United States is being oppressed by the federal government. Period. Just doesn't exist. Has it existed in the past? Yes. Doesn't exist now. 
And furthermore, how are you going to end depression by not standing for the national anthem during a football game? It's literally less valuable than putting a bumper sticker on your car. It's less valuable than a retweet. It is so absurd. By the way, who's the group that's in favor of oppression? If you're coming out in favor of something and nobody else is on the other side, you're not brave. You're just a front-running bitch. Finally, uh, my TV show. People want to know what happened. I'll tell you again. There's an article up on OutKick. You can go read it. Let me tell you all about it, okay? Two years ago, I was offered the national morning show on Fox Sports Radio that would be simulcast on TV. Uh, I was told that I needed to do that show with a former professional athlete. Eddie George is a good buddy of mine. Eddie George and I auditioned for that show. They did not think we were contentious enough. We did not embrace debate enough. Me being SEC, him being Big Ten, they didn't think that it was going to be enough of an embrace debate show. So they didn't like Eddie and I together. They said we needed to find somebody else to be on the show with me. I said it was Eddie was my pick. If you want me to do the show, then I'm going to do it with Eddie. They said no. And so I said, okay, I'm leaving. And I started doing this daily Facebook and Periscope show. I said, I'm happy to do something else for you down the line, but I'm not going to do this morning show. So I turned down the morning show a couple of years ago. This past March, and I didn't, or February, and I didn't publicize this, but the New York Daily News last month got some sources inside of Fox after Jamie Horowitz was fired saying that I had turned down a, radio, uh, turned down a television show that was going to air in the evening. That's true. I turned down a show because I was told that I could not talk about pop culture or politics at all, and I couldn't talk about politics because my politics were too conservative. That shows you how left-wing the sports media has become that me, a guy who's never voted for a Republican for president, a guy who is, uh, is pro-choice and anti-the death penalty, for example, a guy who's pro-legalization of drugs, uh, at least marijuana and many others, is considered too conservative to actually be able to share his opinion on television. Uh, I said uh, I was offered a, a, my own show, and I thought about it, and I debated it and everything else, and I said that I was not willing to change what I was doing. You can go read about that if you're curious about it. But so I've turned down two shows on Fox. Uh, does that mean I'll never get another opportunity? Maybe. Uh, my answer on this is straightforward. If you want me to do television, I want to do television the same way that I do Facebook, the same way that I do Periscope, the same way that I do writing, the same way that I do radio. I want to be smart, original, funny, and authentic sofa every single day. And so if you want me, then I want to be able to be my full self and be as authentic as I possibly can be. If you don't want me to do that, then I'm fine doing exactly what I do now, which is having what I think is the best job in America, having a wildly successful morning radio show, having a insanely successful business that has turned into a multi-million dollar business, which I never would have believed, and uh, that, uh, that allows me to talk about any and everything under the sun, whether it's Charlottesville, Zeke Elliott, like today, protested the anthem, or the fact that the Gators have suspended seven guys for uh, the, their game against Michigan or just gambling, which I love to do a lot of. So I want to be able to do the full fruition of the stories that I am interested in uh, across the spectrum. And I'm not willing to give up my creative freedom in order to be on TV. There are other people that disagree with that and are willing to sell themselves as much as they possibly can to get onto TV and try to become a TV star. That's cool. If that's what you want, more power uh, for you. But I am not a person who needs to define himself by being on TV. If I get to be on TV in the future, that's great. I'll do a good job of it because I'm good at it. But I'm also good at radio. I'm also good at writing. And I'm good at Periscope and Facebook Live. And frankly, I make more money than 99% of people who are on TV now in the world of sports. I'm a multimillionaire. I make seven figures. Uh, I got a good gig. So I don't have to chase after whatever opportunity is out there. I've just got to keep doing what I'm doing now. I've been poor before. I ain't poor now. Just bought a beach house. Just bought a building in downtown Nashville. I'm rolling, all right? So if at some point TV makes sense and I'd be fine to do it, that makes awesome sense. But I'm not going to sell out my opinions uh, because uh, in order to get on television. I'm not going to be less than what I am, which is the most honest person in sports media today. Uh, I did lose $50,000 on pants for a while, but then I earned it back. Some people may say I'm crazy. You might think I'm an idiot for turning down a multi-million dollar television deal, but that's my decision, and I'm comfortable with it. I have a great life here in Nashville, hot wife, three healthy boys, and I can do so much from Nashville and grow my audience and have such an incredible time uh, that I absolutely love it. So 
if you think that I made an idiotic move, you can call it that. If you think uh, that, uh, that I am a sellout, uh, I actually have tangible evidence that I've done the exact opposite of that. I could have sold out for millions of dollars. I chose not to do it. I doubled down on myself. I'd encourage all of you to do that too because that's the ultimate don't be a pussy lifestyle. People say, oh, Clay Travis, he's making it up, whatever. Find me somebody else who's turned down a multi-million dollar television deal so that he can be as honest as he possibly can every single day. And I will say, okay, that person's in the same category as me. There aren't very many of us. That's why I know that this show is growing. That's why you guys shared at such a high level. I appreciate all of you. My name is Clay Travis. We will have our MSESPN, anti-MSESPN shirts out soon. And yeah, Nick Wright is lying. He doesn't know. I mean, people out there, uh, Nick Wright is, a, is, is uninformed. Uh, and uh, he went on a Twitter street against me today. I wrote the article. You can go read it at OutKick. Um, and uh, we are dominating. And uh, that's the truth. Uh, I love all of you. Uh, you guys are fantastic. My name is Clay Travis. Hashtag DBAP. Go read my story if you're curious about television on OutKick.com front page. And you guys are fantastic. I don't know what's happened with North Korea. When I sat down, nothing had changed with North Korea. Uh, so if something has changed with North Korea, then we will uh, talk about it, I'm sure, in the near future. I am Clay Travis. DBAP, boys and girls. This has been Outkick the Show, presented by Odd Shark. And hold on, I'm not done yet. I got more ads. I got more ads. Do you have a timeshare that you're looking at getting rid of? Are you just not using it or cannot afford it? Let my friends at Magical Realty help you sell it. Magical Realty does not charge any upfront fees to sell your timeshare, only getting paid once it closes. Visit MagicalRealty.com or email them at info at MagicalRealty.com. They might be able to help you rent out your timeshare. If selling is not the best option, contact them today. I love all of you. This has been Outkick the Show, presented by Oddshark. Go to Oddshark for all your gambling and informational related needs. Check out Magical Realty. Check out SeatGeek. I am Clay Travis. And remember, d -back. Don't be a pussy.